Right. Uh, welcome, Gabriel. Um, we have Gabriel Bliard um, telling us today about uh, tools to understand ADS2 CFT1. And with that, the screen is yours. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, thank you for organizing all this. Um, it's lovely, especially in these times, to be able to have discussions and be able to present our work. Um, especially as PhD students, we don't get as many chances to do seminars and presentations. Um, I'm also going to take a moment to thank uh, the University of Parma for hosting me in, in the next few months for a project that's ongoing. Um, so yeah, so, so I hope you're not all too tired from a week of seminars. Um, but uh, so the goal today is going to be to present tools to understand ADS2 CFD1. Um, what I want you to get out of this talk is why ADS2 CFT1 is an exciting topic um, and hopefully understand a bit of um, the efforts um, that um, I, um, I have done with the, with the help um, with my team. So um, uh, my supervisor, Valentina Foreni, um, Lorenzo Bianchi, um, and two people from uh, Italy, Luca Grigolo and Domenico Seminara. So this is going to be um, based on the uh, work analytic bootstrap and Witten diagrams for the ABJM Wilson line. So in that you already have two of the tools that we used. Um, and I'll also mention um, some of the tools in the two current projects, um, one of which was presented by Julia earlier this week, which is um, uh, melon formalism, and another one which uh, has to do with uh, lattice uh, string theory. Um, so the plan for today um, is this. The goal is to give you an insight into what is currently an active and exciting sector of the ADS CFT program. Um, I'll do so. So in the first part, I'll be presenting um, the work we did um, in, in this paper uh, to give like a concrete example. So in this, I'm hoping to give you some of the results and some of the techniques that we used and show you a bit of the math. Um, and in a second part, um, I'll be um, talking about the ongoing projects. So I'll be talking a bit less about the results and more about the method that we're using and the an overview and more of a motivation of why why we want to uh, look at these problems. So I'll start by talking about the current st status um, and a motivation for the ADS2 CFT1. Then I'll talk about um, this um, ADS2 uh, defect CFT correspondence uh, in this setting. Um, and then I'll mention the melon space and the lattice um, uh, string world sheet. So um, given the context of this series of talks, um, I don't think I need to present what the ADS CFT correspondence is, uh, as well as seeing the audience, there are a lot of experts here. Um, but if there are any questions um, on this particular setup, um, please interrupt me um, at a point that seems um, appropriate. So instead, I'll focus more on um, why we're interested in this uh, ADS2 CFT1. What do we mean by this ADS2 CFT1? Um, and which setup we'll be considering. Um, in the recent years, we've had uh, a lot of interest in context of ADS2 CFT1, which kind of seems strange because one would imagine that that would be the lowest dimensional case in which um, you can have this, so perhaps the simplest one. Um, one of the reasons for that is that um, uh, there are some subtleties uh, that have to do with the existence uh, or non-existence of a um, uh, stress tensor in the CFT. But uh, since then, um, there, there's been a better understanding, especially in the context of uh, defects. So we don't have a conserved stress tensor um, in the uh, defect theory because there's an exchange with the bulk. 
Um, but also other um, other things have been realized so that now people are going back to um, this ADS2 CFT1. Um, reasons for which we have this are that um, you have a certain univer universality of the problem. Uh, in any CFTs, you're going to have a subsector that has CFT1. Um, then um, since these sectors are usually restricted sectors of the full theory, they're easier to understand, um, especially when you're considering rich topics such as ABJM. Um, also, you have a large toolbox um, they, um, to, to tackle the problem um, analytically, perturbatively. So using supersymmetry, using ADS computations via direct uh, perturbation theory, um, and bootstrap, for example. Um, recently, there's been, as I said, natural interpretation in terms of the language of defect theories. So uh, one of the cases we're going to be interested in is uh, Wilson lines. So in um, a few years ago, there was um, a paper that's going to be quite similar to the analysis um, that we did. We followed um, the, the analysis uh, that they did by John B. Reuben and Zeitlin, where they considered the half BPS Wilson line um, in N equals course for Yang Mills uh, and its dual um, in ADS5 cross S5. Um, finally, uh, another thing that, that will be just for the motivation, because I won't uh, talk about it anymore, um, there has been some interest in the um, duality between topological quantum mechanics and uh, ADS2 gauge theories. Um, so uh, as promised in, in this first part, I'm going to talk about a very specific example. So uh, this example of the duality is going to be um, type 2a super string theory uh, in ADS4 cross CB3 and its dual, which is the three-dimensional uh, n equals six Trin-Simons um, theory with matter, uh, also known as ABJM, um, which you, you you just heard about. Uh, we're not going to have the, the extension to any n equals eight in this case. Um, but more specifically, uh, we're going to look at two objects within this theory. Um, so in the string theory side, we're going to have the um, uh, open string, um, which is going to be a classical solution of minimal surface, which is ending on um, the, the boundary of, um, of ADS, which is going to define the Wilson line on its boundary. And uh, we're going to have the half BPS Wilson line in the ABJM side. Um, as um, will uh, hopefully become clear, the deformation of these objects um, are dual. And these are the objects that we're going to be interested in. So uh, in the string theory side, it's very clear you have deformations of your world sheet. Um, so at the, at the boundary, but also propagating within um, your world sheet. And um, on the um, gauge theory side, we're going to have operator insertions on your Wilson line. Uh, so you may know uh, these operator insertions uh, from, for example, the displacement operator, which is very famous in the, um, in the calculation of the Bremsstrahlung function uh, by Malda Senna. Um, are there any questions so far? All right, I'll keep on going. So um, here are a few more um, details on the uh, CFT side. Um, don't be too intimidated by any of the uh, equations. I, I really want to give a, an overview so you can understand the computations uh, that we did. So um, explicitly, we have the half BPS Wilson, uh, Wilson loop operator by conformal uh, transformation Wilson line. Um, realized as a holonomy of the appropriate superconnection. So here um, we have a path ordered um, uh, quantity, which has a certain twist, but that's not the um, topic of this talk. Um, 
and this object um, is orientated in the time direction of the theory. So as you would expect, the presence of this Wilson line breaks the overall uh, symmetries of the theory um, as a boundary would um, uh, in an Eisen-like model. Um, and the interesting thing we have in, in such defects is that um, we have a natural ordering um, of the of these symmetries. We have the remaining symmetries, which are um, here uh, su one comma one slash three, um, which, as you see, contains one dimensional conformal group su three and an overall u one. So these are going to um, constrain our observables and um, like order them in. Uh, like through through group theory, and then we have the the broken symmetries. So the symmetries uh, that are broken are only broken at the point where you insert the Wilson line. So, for example, you can imagine that if you put a line in 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 a theory, uh, translations orthogonal to that line are going to be broken, uh, but they're not broken if you're uh, far away from the line, so they're locally broken at the point of the insertion. And these uh, the generators of those symmetries um, are going to um, define some broken word identity uh, so that for each broken uh, symmetry and each, um, uh, each generator of those broken symmetries is going to define an operator insertion. So Intuitively, if you have a line and you and you move it a tiny bit at some point, um, that's what we're going to call a, an operator insertion because you're acting with the symmetry, which changes the uh, the system. Um, so the interesting thing in this case is that these um, operator insertions define a chiral primary. So there's a, um, uh, an extra. Um, extra two operators that need to be um, added for the uh, completeness of the algebra. But you, in, in total, you're going to have these um, eight elements of uh, a super multiplet, which is going to be a, chim a chiral primary of your, uh, of your theory. So what are we computing? Um, on the CFT side of the correspondence, we have a theory living on the one dimensional conformal line um, whose fundamental fields are these operator insertions. So from that now on, basically, until, um, until we need to, we're going to forget everything about the um, theory, um, the overall theory. We're going to concentrate on this CFT1. We have um, we have a symmetry group, which is our uh, SU1, um, comma one slash three with a bosonic subsector, which is a bit more intuitive. And we have fields in this theory, which are these operator insertions, um, whose symmetries we know, whose dimensions we know. And the correlators of these um, fields now uh, are um, are defined as um, as the correlator of the insertions through this um, through through this first formula. Um, and since we still have a uh, remaining conformal um, conformal symmetry, um, we can constrain uh, these uh, these quantities that we want to compute. Um, so the co um, correlation functions. Um, and these, the full conformal field theory can now be defined by its spectrum, uh, so the operator insertions and the correlators, which we are trying to compute. So um, as, as you probably know, the, the, first, um, uh, the first three um, uh, correlators, so the one-point function, two-point function, and three-point function um, are, are fixed um, up to a constant for the three-point function. Um, so the what we'll be interested in looking at are going to be the four-point function of these um, operator insertions. 
Um, notably, we're going to be interested in the dynamical part of these um, uh, of this correlator, which is going to be this g of x, where this uh, prefactor is just um, a non-dynamical um, quantity that that can be factored out. Um, finally, um, I've had a little little graph here in this CFT uh, one. You can compute these quantities through different methods. So at weak coupling, you can use uh, standard perturbation theory um, in, uh, in the overarching theory for the CFT1. Then uh, if you want a, a, an idea for the whole um, uh, theory, you're going to use have to use non-perturbative methods. Um, and finally, uh, uh, at strong coupling, you can uh, use either the ADS CFT correspondence um, or bootstrap, which is going to be what uh, we'll look at next. So, um, to give a little overview of bootstrap, uh, for any of you who are experts of this, please um, be patient because I won't be able to um, uh, give it its due and, and full glory. But the ambitious goal of uh, the bootstrap program is to um, define, well, to um, compute quantities and solve theories using only uh, consistency conditions, symmetries of the, um, uh, of the theory. Um, and in our case, we're going to have a, a minimal um, physical input. Um, so, in our case, um, we're, we're going to use um, the symmetries of the theory, obviously, which is uh, the conformal symmetry, which means that we're going to have a function of only one cross ratio, since we're in one dimension, um, which is a, a conformally invariant um, quantity. Um, then we have um, the crossing symmetry. So it means that uh, under the exchange of two, two identical operators, um, we get the same function. Um, in the language of uh, CFT and bootstrap, um, if we have the operator product expansion, when we bring the second operator close to the first one or close to the third one, we get the same function. Um, and the interesting thing in one dimension, which was solved by um, Pedro Liendo, Carlo Meneghelli, um, and MJF a few years ago, was um, that you can uh, solve the crossing uh, equation um, with a set of families of increasing transcendentality. Um, so explicitly, in our in our case, this means that. Um, you'll have a polynomial solution, which should match your generalized free field result. Um, then you'll have a first order, um, uh, uh, an order one result, which is going to contain log terms. And then a second one, which is going to be um, dialogues and log squares. So if we introduce a strong coupling parameter epsilon, um, just through the um, matching of these theories with general, generalized free field, we expect uh, the ordering uh, of these functions to be linked to the or, uh, ordering of this strong coupling uh, parameter. So um, at zeroth order, we can solve it through uh, free field theory, and we have the solution. Um, but we're interested in this first order. Um, so it turns out that these restrict, uh, re restrictions aren't enough. We need to add um, some input of obviously the quantities we're, we're looking at. Um, in this case, uh, this comes through the selection rules of our chiral primaries, which um, restrict um, the, the function we're, we're looking at. And we, uh, and we computed this and obtained um, an explicit um, first order um, perturbation of this uh, four, four point function. Um, so the, um, the super pri uh, primary of this, um, of this multiplet is, is F. Um, and 
um, basically uh, the uh, the four point function of this f um, uh, dictates basically the the form of all the uh, other ones, uh, which can be found through uh, supersymmetry transformations or in superspace formalism uh, through uh, linear uh, differential operators. Um, if we we can talk about that later if people have questions. Um, so the the result is this: we found uh, this four four point function uh, using bootstrap. Oh, sorry. Um, then on the dual side um, for the uh, for the string theory, the Wilson uh, line is dual to the minimal string surface, which is ending on the contour defining the Wilson line operator at the boundary. Um, the minimal two-dimensional string surface, whose boundary is the one we want, is an ADS2 sheet. Um, so in order to, to compute this, we embed an ADS2 sheet in the full space-time, which is um, ADS4 across CB3. Um, and we can do this quite, quite neatly. Um, uh, and we find that if we do a general embedding, um, of uh, around an ADS2 of deformations uh, about an ADS2 surface, um, we find uh, this action where the x and x bar are complexified um, directions uh, of the remaining ADS4, and the wa and wa bar are the um, compact directions. So um, again, very intuitive to understand where we're deforming a natural surface. Um, and the deformations of this uh, minimal solution um, is uh, given by having non-vanishing um, coordinates in, the, uh, in those remaining uh, directions. Uh, these deformations can be represented as fields propagating um, on the ADS2 surface, um, which happen um, through clever redefinition to match exactly, um, at least on the bosonic side, uh, the symmetries and dimensions of um, the operator insertions on the Wilson line. Um, so on this ADS2 side, we have fields propagating and interacting on this ADS2 sheet. Again, intuitively, you can understand that as if you have a string and you deform it a bit, you represent the actual deformation of the string as um, a field with a certain mass and, and direction. So um, this is something we can do. We have um, interaction vertices. We have propagators in ADS2. And we can um, compute the four-point function of these x fields. Um, so. It's, it's a bit of a tedious task, but you end up with a very complex function, um, which I'm not going to write here because it's kind of horrible. Um, but then we can relate this four-point function of the x fields to the four-point function of um, our chiral um, primary. Um, and through acting with a certain number of supercharges, um, we can uh, link it to the the element that we uh, that we want of that uh, of that chiral primary. Um, there's a bit of abuse of uh, of language, but the the concept is that the four point function of these x fields will be related um, to the function we saw before through a linear uh, differential operator so that we can solve for this function f of chi uh, because uh, this linear differential operator is something we know. And the, the result we obtain is uh, this f of chi. Um, you can ar argue that since it's a differential operator, there are some um, uh, integration con constants. But luckily, we have more than one um, uh, more than one correlation function. So we were able to eliminate those. So we find a perfect uh, agreement uh, up to the identification um, of this um, strong coupling expansion parameter with one over four pi t. 
Um, so that sums up the, the, the first part of my talk. Um, I'll go very quickly through, through these last bits because since um, there's still a few details to iron out, um, I didn't want to present too many details, but more motivate why uh, a melon formalism in 1D is needed. Um, so the melon formalism is based on, I would say an ancient transform, the melon transform. Um, and um, it was found that uh, the structure of these correlators has a much simpler structure um, and is linked to physically intuitive quantities such as poles. Um, also uh, about a decade ago, um, there was a very clear um, uh, interpretation of these uh, mellow amplitudes as scattering amplitudes. Um, and um, yes, so, so the, the structure you'll have is, uh, is this. So for a four um, point correlator, you're going to have uh, an inter uh, integration over these two, what is called melon variables, uh, which are going to link, be linked to these uh, two cross ratios. Um, you, you can probably already see where, where the problem is in one dimension. Um, in one dimension, you only have one cross ratio, one physical cr cross ratio, which you can obviously link to these U and Bs. Um, however, um, it means that we have something that's well defined that if you know the Mellon transform, you can find the four point correlator and you don't have the other way around. Um, you have a de degenerate uh, Mellon amplitude. Um, or a redundancy of this melon description. Um, so, so a goal uh, for a 1D melon transform would be to find something that has the same nice uh, structure and also has this physically intuitive um, um, construction, um, but that isn't, um, that only has one uh, melon variable, which is linked to the one, um, and cross ratio. The challenges in this is um, the, the non-trivial -tri um, behavior of these um, functions and transforms. The fact that the 1D case is usually seen as a limiting case um, of the higher dimensional theories, uh, which means that bad behaviors usually happen there, which can be controlled, but uh, ha have to be careful. Um, and also because usually the integrals considered are quite hard. Um, oh, well, I was going to speak about lattice, but the, um, yeah, the time is, 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 uh, running. So, um, uh, oh, I'll, I'll talk about qu quickly the, um, so far, if you gauge fix, um, uh, a string world sheet action, um, you can discretize the two dimensional world sheet. Um, and this has been done in the case of the um, dual to the um, uh, cusped, um, uh, light like cusped Wilson um, line in, AD, uh, in the ADS5 process five case. And the goal um, would be to apply this to the system we uh, looked at earlier. Um, mostly to get non-perturbative um, descriptions and results um, for these for these quantities. Um, so to conclude, um, ADS two CFD one uh, gives massive playground to explore loads of tools and techniques. So through explicit computations of Witten diagrams, um, there's a solid use of superspace and uh, supersymmetry. Um, the bootstrap program uh, is also very useful. Um, and then being able to, to, to link that to Mellon amplitudes and lattice de description is um, one of the goals. So in this, uh, in the first um, part, of the, um, part of the presentation, I sh uh, showed two independently computed solutions uh, which agree up to this identification. Uh, it provides a perturbative description of a fermion four-point function, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, found indirectly, yes, but it 
it does uh, give this physical uh, four-point correlator for fermions. Um, it, uh, since we have an analytic result, uh, we can analyze the spectrum. So perturbatively, the um, an anomalous dimension and first order. Um, and the new tools for ads 2 cft one uh, include these uh, Melnin amplitudes, where there's still this need for non-redundant description to understand uh, it fully. And um, it would also benefit a lot from the lattice world sheet descri description, where we can where we can look at um, non-perturbative um, uh, corrections. So um, possible directions um, other than what we're working on right now uh, would be um, finding topological sectors in these um, in, in these settings. So um, one of the results of this calculation is that there isn't a, a topological sector um, for for these type of um, displacement multiplet. Uh, multiply so perhaps applying this to other defects would be uh, would be a way to go. Um, thank you for listening, and if you have any questions, I'm very happy to answer. Yeah, thank you very much for your nice talk. Are there any questions? Well, I can um, get started in just asking a question which may or may not be of great use. I, I was wondering, um, there has been a lot of work uh, in terms of, of um, chaos uh, setups in, in ADS-CFT and trying to understand the, the physics of black holes in that way. Um, and in that context, people have, have looked at out of time order correlators, um, four, four point functions um, uh, that are high, out of time ordered. And um, I was wondering, since you have uh, nice expressions for these four fermion four point functions um, and potentially like a nice understanding of the, the um, of them in terms of this melon transform, I was wondering if you had thought about um, maybe looking into chaos and, and that direction with this. Um, I, I hadn't, could you, could, 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 could you explain a bit more about the out of time um, um, bits? Yeah, I, I don't know if it's at all um, applicable, but um, you, like you, you just have, um, normally you have a certain, um, like a time ordering in your, in your um, Green's functions and for example, in the four point functions, like you have shown them. But then if you, if you insert operators, um, in a, in a funny order along the um, along the time contour, then then you get out of time operators, uh, correlators, and and so um, I'm not sure if this is at all feasible. Um, but the idea is that, that these tell you about quantum chaos. Um, so these four point functions behave like um, e to the minus, uh, and then there's a um, basically there's a um, exponent that contains the Lyapunov exponent, uh, which it tells you how quickly uh, your either your, your, two point, uh, your four point function increases or decreases. So telling you if it's a stable or an unstable system. Um, if it's growing, then it's, it's telling you that it's a chaotic system growing with that Lyapunov exponent. And then there's a factor which is, um, contains the butterfly velocity, which tells you how, how fast um, th this works. And then um, I, again, I'm not quite sure how much has been done um, in this direction like with with um, approaches that that you might have at your disposal, but uh, that was just an idea. Maybe this is something to to think about. More well, more, more comment than maybe a question. So yeah, I I'm I think that 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 would be very interesting. There's there's um I mean there's a very clear um interpretation of like things that aren't in the in the uh, right order. If you only have one dimension, which is literally just kind of mm -hmm. um, them not just being in the in the right place, there's any like contoured uh, deformation or boost that can like kind of change the orders of those things. Um, but there are also some like additional um, complications, which which in the context of CFTs, I mean, pr probably not related to to that exact 
thing, but it, um, uh, you usually have crossing equations um, for a bootstrap uh, in higher dimensions, whereas um, in this context, it, it, you, you cannot cross operators because um, you would um, you would have two operators, one on top of the other in one dimension. So mm -hmm. um, it, it, it really is a more formal way of just kind of approaching operators um, to, to either side of their, uh, their limit. You can't, you can't really cross um, operators as is done in, in higher dimension, um, noticeably because you get a, an extra kind of phase that, 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 that comes in. Um, explicitly, if, if you have, like, for example, log of one minus chi, um, if you do a transform that turns um, one minus chi to chi minus one, um, basically you'll get this extra uh, log of minus one that, 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 uh, that's in your correlator. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I, I, it, it, it must be, it must be very different because there, there, there isn't any um, uh, we don't have any of the um, butterfly velocity and the uh, exponential decaying. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. That's just a just a wild thought. Does anybody other uh, else have have questions or comments? Yeah, I have a question. It's actually much naiver than that. So ADS2 gave a lot of headache in holography because of this finite entropy at zero temperature. Is there a way to understand this from the CFT side, like using the CFT1 or something like that? Finite entropy at zero temperature. Oh, um, it's not a closed system. That's, that's I think that's, um, you, is, you, so, uh, the the context in which we're we're looking at it, um, the CFT one, um, like we look at it as a as a theory, but it uh, it 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 is something that's embedded um, within a a larger a larger theory. So so when we look at these these operators, we're actually looking at the uh, deformations within this larger theory of the. Um, uh, of this CF, uh, of this Wilson line, I think if you consider what would be called like a, a pure ADS two CFT one, um, in which you you just have a two dimensional space and you want it to be well behaved, I think you you still get those headaches. I see. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions? All right, that does not seem to be the case. Um, so what I'll do is stop the recording and if there's any questions off script. And uh, so first, let me thank all the, um, uh, the speakers of this session, especially Gabriel. Thanks for your talk again. Thanks for everyone participating. And there will be an afternoon session today uh, starting at 5.15 Central European time. So 